sponsor at Wego. It's kind of interesting. Wego is spelled W-E-G-O, right? Yeah. So you're kind of probably thinking, that's not exactly the acronym. Oh. So just to tell you guys, we actually had a change in our name. We used to be called the World League Governments Organization of cities and local governments. That's kind of wrong. Basically, we used to focus on e-government only. That's mm. kind of like IT for government services. But then we kind of expanded our scope because we realized e-government's kind of a legacy, if you will. So we kind of expanded our scope and went for kind of smart, sustainable cities, which actually includes e-government, but it has a lot of other aspects, like Tokyo study you saw. Tokyo's pretty impressive, right? Yes. Can you like zoom in and like do all that stuff too? Because I think there's a feature where you could zoom in and you could see someone's cell phone and you could kind of actually read that. He didn't show you that, right? Because that's kind of privacy, but yes. So that's, so that's what we're we go, but we didn't change our acronym because it kind of rolls in your tongue, right? We go, like we, we know go. we go. Um, there's a precedence because I think you guys heard of an international organization called UNICEF. Yeah, yes. I've heard this, yes. They actually changed their name to, I can't remember, but, but they used to be United Nations International Children's Education Fund, whatever, but then they changed their name to something else which does not stand for UNICEF anymore. They, but they kind of kept it because everyone knows UNICEF as UNICEF. So we kind of follow that trend as well. Um, I guess before I start, before I do my kind of introduction on what this organization, what I do, I just wanted to bring about some um, some of the reasons why this organization was created in the first place. To be honest, we were created by the Seoul Metropolitan Government mm. from, I think, the past mayor. I think this, uh, his name was Wu Seung or something. He actually created this organization in 2010. So we're kind of young-ish. If you compare it to like another international organization like the UN, they were created in like the 1940s, right? So we're kind of a startup-ish international organization, but we expanded a lot, which I'll talk about soon. But before I talk about organization, I'll talk about some of the reasons why we, like, there's a need for us in the first place. But maybe you guys kind of saw some of these, I guess, um, issues in other presentations, so I'll kind of go through it briefly. So, I'm sure you know, urbanization, you know. You know, a long time ago, people used to kind of rely on agriculture, agrarian society, things like that. And as technology advanced, we started to kind of urbanize and start to live in cities. And cities are great, of course, I'm sure you know. You know, there's like amazing infrastructure, there's movie theaters, there's public infrastructure, like public transportation, cities are wonderful. You know, there's specialization, etc. But like everything else, there's always good and bad. And there are some bad signs about having a big city as well. Maybe some of you guys could guess what do you think are some of the negative impacts of urban sprawl or having a big city? Any, any okay, good, pollution. Because, you know, like for example, if it's like a village or something, there shouldn't be too much pollution. There should be enough, we call it carrying capacity for the earth to kind of mitigate the polluting effects. But in cities, as you know, there's millions of people and there are, there's a lot of pollution, especially in Korea, like for example, air quality. I don't know about in your countries, you guys have some air pollution problems as well, perhaps, I'm guessing. We'll talk about that soon, because there's a lot of problems, and what we do we, is what we do is we try to solve these problems by using you know, smart city, IT, that kind of stuff. So, so I'll kind of briefly go through some of the, I guess, rise of cities and its challenges. So I'm sure you've seen this before. You know, in the 1950s, more people kind of lived in rural areas, like you know, farms, you know, things like that. And as time passed, like technology passed, all that stuff, it was at this point where the world started to live in more urban city areas. And obviously, we're this kind of updated, but we're kind of here, so a lot more people live in cities now. So there is a demand for you know city for us to actually resolve some of these urban problems. So um, I guess I won't go through this too much, but you know, urbanization trends, etc. I kind of talked about this. Our world population is 7.3, roughly and <clears throat> surpass 50%, so we, I just want to reiterate that cities are kind of the future, and we need to solve some of these other problems. Not only are people getting urbanized, there have been a lot more, not just like cities, but mega cities. Maybe some of you are from some mega city, maybe Metro Manila, or I don't know, Bangkok, for example. Seoul is definitely a mega city. It has 10 million, more than 10 million people. I think Greater Seoul area might have hover around 20 million. Greater Seoul, I'm talking about like some of the satellite cities as well, 
like Songnam, for example, Korea, things like that. And you could see a lot of them are centered in Asia, you could see. And as you know, cities of maybe, let's say, 500,000, maybe it's not so bad, but once it approaches this 10 million size, there's a lot of issues. Traffic, you know, like urban sprawl, like what about housing? I think in Seoul, from what I remember, Seoul is probably the sixth most expensive city to live. Yeah. Not so much because of like food or something. Have you guys heard of Kimba? Yes. Yes, it's cheap, like two dollars, let's say. Uh, those stuff are cheap, but we're talking about things like housing. And then, it's, it's extraordinarily expensive because there's a lot of people, a lot of demand, things like that. So what we do is we try to resolve these problems. Because if you th think about it, how do you resolve the housing crisis through technology? And there's ways, which I'll talk about soon. So there's a lot of cities, fastest growing cities are in Africa and Asia. I'm sure you guys knew that. Um, so you could see here, there's a lot of African like mega cities, Asia obviously. Europe is not as, Europe's already kind of developed, so they kind of are not as growing as fast anymore. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'll give you some projections, I guess. I'll kind of skip it. You can kind of see there'll be a lot more urban centers, etc. And so the challenge is, you guys talk about pollution. <coughs> now I'll talk about some more stuff. Poverty. Because if you think about it, you know, like I said, for example, housing, or maybe in a city like Seoul, there's lots of competition. So maybe if you didn't, I don't know, maybe study as hard, you might, you know, end up with like a low paying job and you might have poverty, which is a huge issue in urban centers. So if you lived in like an agricultural society, you could just farm, make your own food, you know, maybe dig up a well. You don't need to worry about poverty as much because you could kind of just you know, have your own land and just live off the land. But cities, obviously, there's huge challenges in poverty. I think especially in Asia, because it's rapidly growing so quickly. Um, have you guys been to Seoul Station? Yes. yes. We have a, property, pro a problem, poverty problem there as well, because you can see kind of a lot of homeless people there. And we do have some um, solutions in terms of technology, which I'll talk about soon. <clears throat> Social security, a little bit goes hand in hand with poverty. Social security, what job am I going to get? You know, what am I going to do when I retire? And things like that. <clears throat> waste and pollution. You guys mentioned pollution. Waste is kind of similar to, you know, like garbage collection, things like that. Solid waste management, things like that. I think the, there was a director who presented on some of these things, I think, right? A little bit. But I guess I'll touch upon it too, soon too. Another one's water and energy. 10 million people, how do you actually deliver the water? Yes, pipes and things like that, but it's not as simple as that. What if the pipes leak? What if it was made in the 40s where there's lead? What are you gonna do about things like that? Energy is a huge problem too for sustainability and all that stuff, but 10 to 20 million people, how are you gonna really supply their energy? Because maybe we shouldn't use coal anymore because it's polluting things like that. <coughs> Traffic congestion, that's huge, I'm sure. Um, yes, Seoul is, supposedly one of the better ones, considering that it's a mega city, but still we have traffic, like I drive, and especially on the weekends, traffic is horrible. Because on the weekdays, they might take like, the subway to come to work. <coughs> but on weekends, people want to go out and use their cars, and there's heavy congestion. <coughs> you guys took the subway here. Yeah. Who's taking the subway in Seoul? Will you guys get the opportunity? I'm not sure, maybe Jim, they will, no? It will be great, because I think um, one of the key, um, one of the things that Seoul kind of could say, oh, we're really good at is kind of transportation, but especially public transportation, especially subways. It's so well, I, I think it's so well organized that a lot of homeless people sometimes kind of go there to kind of live there, kind of <laughs> hang out. Maybe it's really hot outside, go there, get some fresh air conditioning, things like that. So, health problems, obviously, that's another one. And green space, that's a huge one. because. For Seoul, to be honest, I think Seoul isn't as good in terms of green spaces like other cities, like for example, London like that, but we're getting there, so. We do have Pond River. Mm. Sorry about that. It's okay. Who's been to Pond River? Yes, it's, it's, it's really nice there. Um, Seoul's really trying to provide some good green spaces there, but yes, space is limited, so. Um, you guys probably saw this. Yeah. Yeah. You guys saw SDGs, yes. Sustainable Cities and Communities, and that's what, where we specialize in. So. Um, so I guess I won't go through this too much. It's about you know, COVID-11, et cetera. So I won't go through this too much. So now that you have seen that cities, there's a lot of difficulties and challenges. Now I'll kind of start talking about my organization. 
and what we do to kind of mitigate, resolve, or at least lessen the challenges of these um, in terms of our organization. And what was it? It's kind of hobby or something. So what is WeGo? It's an international organization. Um, if you think about international organization, probably the first one that pops into your mind is the UN. Obviously, United Nations. I'm sure you've heard of the United Nations. I'll kind of make a comparison because, you know, the UN, I, I'm assuming that you guys know kind of more about the UN than any other organization. So the UN, I think it currently has around 189 country members. Basically, Basically, every single member on Earth is a member of every single country. I think there's a couple that are not like, maybe like Equatorial Guinea or something, but basically every single is there. <clears throat> like that, we also have members too. But unlike the UN, we don't have country members, we have city members, because we are World's <coughs> we'll Smart Smart Cities Organization. <coughs> and also it's, bec it's because the Seoul Metropolitan Government made us. So Seoul Metropolitan Government is a huge city, you can almost call it a country, but it's not. So that's why we focus on cities. Also, like the UN, have you guys heard of the UN Security Council? Yes, yes it's a um, group of countries, France, UK, US, China, and Britain. Hmm. Oh, Russia. oh, Russia, yes. What did I say? UK, Let's do it. You, oh, sorry, US, France, China, Russia, and, and France. No, no friends, I can't remember that. Okay, UK, sorry, yes. Well, that's interesting, France is not in there. So, but anyways, so these are the group of countries in the UN Security Council. They make the most important decisions. Let's say there's a, a war that's about, or the, let's say there's a civil war in a country in Africa and you want to intervene, this UN Security Council will make the decision to intervene or not, things like that. Since we're an international organization, we also follow this kind of, kind of, um, like a stature. We also have something like a UN Security Council, but for us we call it the Executive Committee members. They're made up of cities, Executive um, Security Council made of countries, we're made of cities, and these are some of the cities. Maybe you know, like um, Ulaanbaatar. Where's Ulaanbaatar? Okay, great, Mongolia. Yes, they are one of our Executive Committee members, and we meet once a year, like the UN. I guess UN meets probably more than once a year. They meet when there's emergencies, but for us, they're Hopefully there aren't any emergencies. So we meet once a year. We're gonna meet this year in two th uh, in October in uh, what's that? Oh, Quezon City in Philippines. Uh, maybe some of you know it's near Met Metro Manila, and we're gonna have this uh, a kind of meeting there. So all our executive committee members will be present. Usually mayors, but if the mayors can't make it, maybe the vice mayor or maybe the chief information officers, because we're kind of an IT organization. And in there, like the UN Security Council, we make decisions, we vote on things. We vote on approval of new member cities, we vote on next year's budget, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and what else, like the UN, I'm sure you guys wonder, how does the UN operate, because they need money. I'm sure maybe some of you know, they get money from the member countries, in terms of GDP mostly. So, I'm sure you know, US pays the most, maybe not now because of Trump, but usually they <laughs> used to pay the most. And obviously Japan pays a lot, et cetera, et cetera. We also have a similar system, but obviously it's not a country, but it's our cities. So we have 137 cities that if they join, they're required to pay membership. It's not expensive. Um, we base it on the city's population and their GDP per capita, PPP, IMF. So for example, let's say, um, okay, Seoul, because Seoul's our president city, but they're also a member as well. They pay 10,000 US dollars, because that's the maximum cap. Because so we, we take the country's GDP, which is quite a lot, and I think it's like 35,000, whatever, and we take the population, which is a lot. So they pay 10,000. Another city that would pay maximum is, for example, Moscow. They're, Russia's considered somewhat rich, and the city has a lot of population, so they pay 10,000. And it's with this membership fee that we run our programs, you know, pay my salary, et cetera, things like that. <laughs> Um, what are some other cities you want? Oh, Hanoi is in there. As vice president city, executive member city, it's basically the same thing. So, 
Yes, and Jakarta, I'm sure you guys recognize. So we're very close to them. We work with the mayor, vice mayor, etc., things like that. We have also four regional offices around the world, uh, which I'll tell you about very soon. They're one Asia, Europe, Latin America, and Mediterranean. You're probably wondering where they are. They are over here. Mexico City is a Latin America regional office. Has anyone been to Mexico City? Because I haven't. Um, they've been inaugurated very recently, so uh, most likely Mayor Park and us will go to uh, Mexico City for the opening ceremony around October. Yes. You know, Mexico, they just had an election, did you guys know? And AMLO won, unfortunately. <laughs> Next up, we have a Mediterranean regional office. Beigu is a district in Istanbul, so maybe you guys know. Ulinov region, it's, um, it's a city in, in Russia. You, buy, you, buy, you guys probably haven't heard of that. Chengdu, maybe you guys have heard of Chengdu. In Sichuan province in China, they're a huge city too. I think the greater Chengdu area might be around 30 to 40 million people, but that's China. Yes, so we're very close to them, obviously, and President City, the Secretariat, is in Seoul. We're not in City Hall, but we're very nearby. We use a building that's owned by so much Paul government. It's in the Seoul Global Center. It's about five minute walk from here. Uh -huh. And what's really good about that building is it houses a lot of the international organizations that are in Seoul. For example, World Bank, UNICEF, UNESCO, um, like International Bar Association, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of creates a synergy effect. So we work closely with them a lot. So, yeah, so we currently have around 137 members. So we started with 50 in 2010, yes. The people came to that inaugural General Assembly, they signed, they became members, and then we eventually started reaching out more and more, doing programs together, and we now have 137 members worldwide, which is a lot. Um, if you guys are interested, you could take the brochures later, because it lists all the cities, and I'm pretty sure a lot of these cities you guys are from, because we have a lot of ASEAN cities, a lot actually. So you could see, so we have 59, the most, most of our bulk of our members are from Asia, and of course Africa too. You kind of see here, bulk of them are here and here obviously because they need the most assistance. So we wonder, then why would Europe and America join? Because to be honest, maybe they're a bit more advanced, but you know they could always get some help in um, smart city areas, but especially because Seoul has a lot of advanced smart city features like Topis you saw, and we do kind of share it with other advanced cities. But also what we do is we, help other member cities, perhaps share their knowledge to another city here, for example. So maybe they have some really good solutions in Europe, maybe like, for example, Paris is our member. Maybe they have a really good smart city um, um, <clears throat> solution, and maybe another member city saw that, and we would link them up. Maybe they would bring their company here, and it would be a win-win situation, things like that. <clears throat> so um, I guess I will go through. So our vision, basically, is smart, sustainable cities for all, to kind of, what we want to do is, like I said, use smart, sustainable city technologies, things like that, to kind of resolve the city's issues, which ultimately means better lives for the citizens. So that's what this kind of means, smart, sustainable cities for all, for the homeless, for the rich, for the poor, for everybody, yes. So, yeah, you kind of read this, I won't go through it too much, basically, using smart city of technology to advance the lives of the citizens, that's what we do. Uh, yeah, that's basically what this is. I won't go through it too much. Um, I guess I won't go this too much because I just kind of wanted to find sustainability because there's so many definitions out there. But this is one of our how we kind of define sustainability. But um, I guess you guys can look at it, but I'll, I'll just skip that for now. So um, these are some of the pillars of a smart, sustainable city. So what kind of areas do we work on? These are our six main pillars. Smart government. For example, it could be like a platform that a government uses. For example, um, we did a, uh, we, we implemented an e-office system in a city called Addis Ababa. Do you know this city? Ethiopia. Perfect, wow. Yes, it's a capital city of Ethiopia. One of their issues was, this was back in like 2012, they did everything manually, meaning all their government records, all their tax records, everything signed is on, in paper which isn't terribly bad, but then Addis Ababa, it's a big city. It has millions of people. So since their records were all digitized, they dedicated an entire building with just cabinets, and all the stuff was in there. So 
So for example, if I'm a citizen in Addis Ababa, maybe I am um, suing another person because maybe they're trying to take my land. Then the government official or the court person has to go into this building, locate the, the paper, all that stuff. That was very, very time consuming, very inefficient. So we implemented a paperless e-office government system there. And that's, for example, what we do with smart government. Smart people, we, I'll talk about this in a little more detail. We do many things, but one of the things we do is we have actual software where citizens could kind of participate in some of um, government's policies. I think the director today talked about M voting. Yeah. Do you guys M voting, that? For yes. For example, that would be something that we would do, etc. So these are some of the key, I guess, pillars that we work on small economy, smart living, smart mobility, and smart environment. There's other stuff too, but basically we base it on this. So now, what do we actually specifically do? Because you guys probably wonder, these are our activities, our, our actual programs that we do. Why did I make these in green? Because these are the ones I'll talk about in detail, because I can't talk about all of them. <clears throat> Just to sum up, we do have the typical conferences and exhibitions. International organization, um, knowledge sharing is a huge part. So we do participate. What I mean by that is, for example, here, I came to do a speech. They would invite us to do a lot of, um, I guess, speakerships or maybe session organization in a lot of their smart city conferences. Like Dubai might call us and be like, can you do um, a session on blockchain? And we'd go there and we'd talk about blockchain and government news, for example. So a lot of work does have to do with conferences and exhibitions, but we do have a lot of specific other specific programs, to which I'll talk in detail soon. I'm trying to think, uh, yes. So I'll talk about some of these in detail and we'll talk about more if you have time. Okay, so capacity building. What is this? You've heard of this a lot, capacity building. What, is this, what does this actually entail? Maybe someone could kind of answer this question. What is capacity building? Does that mean like, do I build a building or what does this exactly mean? Okay, perfect, education, training, capacity building for the people. Because, like I said, we have member cities around the world, and what we do is we invite them to kind of train them on some of the latest trends in smart cities or some of the challenges they have. Because we ask them, what kind of challenges does your city need? They tell us maybe they don't know how to implement a um, smart waste management system. Then we bring them, and then we have a session or two on smart waste management. Some of the things they need to look at, some of the, you know, how they do the bidding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, yes, oh, you remember we had an Asia regional office in Chengdu? We have a training program there as well. The phone's kind of small, but you can kind of see me here. <laughs> yeah, so we took them there, I did a session, other people did a session, there's a city tour, you know, typical stuff. This would be kind of a little bit similar to what you guys are doing. Because this is a little bit capacity building, right? It kind of allows you to gain knowledge, not just about like IT, but about like other Asian, Asian countries, etc. So we do this, but unlike this, we usually cater to public officials like mayors. You could be CIOs, things like that. It's quite popular. We do. We have it twice in Seoul, like twice in Seoul, once in Jeju Island. Have you heard of Jeju Island? Yeah. Yes. And once in um, Asia. And this one, I'll be going next week, Monday, actually. And I've been organizing it, but I'll be doing a session on blockchain technology and government use. Sounds kind of important, but anyways. And I do have a video, but I'll skip it for now, because maybe you guys are wondering what this actually entails. Because I think you guys do some videos too, right? I saw on Facebook, some of you guys did some of these things like that. So I kind of recognize some of your faces. <laughs> so, but it was actually well made. So we do have a video like that, but maybe I'll show it to you after, because it's actually kind of cool. So this I really like, because you actually get to like mingle with the people, like you guys. Maybe you guys will be lifetime friends, who knows? Instagram, you have Facebook, things like that. So maybe one day you'll have a sofa to sleep on, like on your friends, for example. So this is one of the programs I really like because you actually get to meet people from around the world and actually make friends. And thanks to technology, we could keep in touch. WhatsApp and on Viber. What do you guys use? WhatsApp? Kakaotalk, Viber, maybe things like Telegram, things like that. So. Yes, yeah, so I'll talk about that a little more detail later, but yes, and in the curriculum, it's all about smart city, like, you know, like smart city best practices, waste management, you know, it could be like environment, things like that, so kind of similar to you guys. Um, also, we have something called the UN KPS for Smart Sustainable Cities, because 
maybe there's a city in Africa somewhere, and the mayor's like, you know what, I want to turn my city into a smart city. But then, what does he do from there? He need, first, he, first he needs to have kind of a, we call it a master plan, kind of, kind of an overview plan to show how this city will become smart. What are you going to do first? Which platform are you going to use? Things like that. And to see how smart your city is in the first place, you need to have some kind of a benchmarking. And we use something called the United Nations Key Performance Indicators for Smart Sustainable Cities. It sounds cool and all, but basically it's just kind of a set of um, questionnaire, maybe like 100 questions. And the officials who know IT and the mayor, they answer it together, and the answer shows you which kind of um, aspects of your city is quote unquote dumb and not smart. So from there you can see, <laughs> okay, wow, like our waste management is really kind of dumb and inefficient. I need to make it smart. And then you make a plan like that through this, for example. So the UN made this and we work with it together because a lot of cities are, oh, we want to become smart, like help us. But then like, that's, that, that's way too big. So first we make them take this and then we see the key, um, I guess, um, key topics that they need help in. It could be management, public transportation, etc. This would show that. So yeah, so that's that. Um, this is one of our main programs. For Smart City, we actually have to go there and implement something, right? Obviously, it could be like a sewage system. It could be like, like I mentioned, that e-office system in Addis Ababa, things like that. We actually go to cities and implement them. And what we do is before we do like a full wide city implementation, we have to first test it out. So we, that's something called a feasibility study and pilot project. Feasibility study means is this project actually feasible for the city to actually you know, do things. Um, in 2015, we did a lot of it, but these are some of the key ones. 2015, we have something called a citizen complaint management system. It's kind of a software. It's actually an in-house software. It's made through WordPress and PHP. Yeah. I think she told me 50% of your kind of the IT people. So it's a, it's a cloud-based software. It's the layouts, I think, made from Bootstrap. But anyways, so mm -hmm. what we do is this is software that, which allows citizens to kind of make complaints. Similar to, you've heard of, did the director talk about Nepso? She did during the Seoul Metropolitan Government presentation. Maybe she does, I think so. Yeah. Or, yeah, so it's kind of a complaint system where, for example, let's say um, uh, I have a house and in front of my house there's a road. That road is public infrastructure, so the city needs to maintain it. But let's say there's a huge pothole and you know it sucks for me because you know I drive and stuff. Then what I would do is I'll download this app. It's a hybrid app, Epic and um, web, web. What you would do is download this app on your Android, iOS, take a picture of the pothole, write it, and send it. It'll go to the relevant department, it'll point it on Google Maps, and there'll be a, a, a person who's been designated, and they would have to resolve it within 72 hours, for example. If they don't resolve it, then the supervisor and mayors could see this, and then maybe if he's really bad, he get fired, for example. So things like that. But basically, it's to help the citizens. But then, since we're an international organization, we need to serve our member cities. The citizens are important, but to be honest, there's still politics involved. For example, the mayor. Yeah. So when we want this implemented in the cities, we need to make it kind of quote unquote sweet for the mayor too. So we say, if we do this, and you resolve a lot of problems, you'll probably get the votes, obviously. So no, we kind yeah. of cater to them this way. Yeah. Another thing we did was, this is kind of a cool one, smart street land and traffic light monitoring system. <clears throat> so this is a member city called, um, do you know Severan Parai? Malaysia. Yes, yes, Malaysia, perfect, yes. Kuala Lumpur is number one, and from what I know, number two city is Severan Parai in terms of population. They're a member city, Kuala Lumpur is a member city, they're a member city, and they, um, um, they came to us with a problem. What well, their oh, problem yeah. is, Several so prime, maybe some have been there. It's a great city. It's not a poor city at all. It's really good. They have good infrastructure, roads, traffic lights, land holes, all that. But what their problem is, it's um, kind of old fashioned, quote unquote, kind of legacy. They use old halogen lamps, And one of the things is, you know, on a, let's say there's a street, there's many lampposts, right? And sometimes lampposts, they become broken. That's an issue in many aspects. For example, safety. If you're a female, you're walking at night, if there's no lights, you know, you might yeah, get I hurt in some way, you might get, someone that. might do bad things to you. So it's a very important issue. <clears throat> but the problem is, in a city, there might be like 
2,000, 3,000, 5,000 lampposts, right? And what they do is they manually check each area to see if it's working or not. So that means the crew has a truck, just drives and looks, okay, everything's okay, it's fine. That's not bad, but it's very inefficient, right? Because if several parts like this, you go to each sector, if it's not broken, you wasted gas, time, taxpayer time, etc. So they're like, you know what? Yeah, with, with the, reasons, the electronic reasons like that, like come help traffic. Us. It also was for traffic lights too. You know, in your intersection, there's traffic light. If it gets broken, nobody knows. So how the city would fix it is, you know, the citizen might make a complaint. You know, there's huge traffic here. Can you come fix it? Then you would come fix it. Very inefficient because that would mean there's traffic, you know, and then that traffic congestion is bad in many ways. So they said help us. So what we did is <clears throat> we took some smart city experts, some companies, because I'm not an engineer. I'm good with technology, but I'm not an engineer. So we have a, a set of corporate members, for example, with smart city um, solutions. So we went in there, we um, installed an IoT sensor that measures lumens on the traffic light and the lamppost. You know, lumen, the intensity of light. If it approaches a certain lumen, like as in if it goes under, that means it's broken. So we connected that IoT sensor. There's a modem in there, GSM modem, that goes to the telecommunication company. There's kind of an interface that the government has, and it would pinpoint exactly on Google Maps which one's broken. So that was very efficient because now instead of, I don't know, uh, 200 crews driving around, you could hire 10. So you save taxpayers dollars. Not only that, you save the environment. Instead of 20 trucks, you just need two. Because we could just say, oh, you could just sit around, do nothing, until this one's broken, go, like that. So it was very um, rewarding for me, at least. So there's that. <laughs> Another one, this one was Jump also very the... interesting. Um, yeah. There's a city called, I would be impressed if you know this city. There's a city called um, La Marsa. Do you know this city? I'd be very, very impressed. That's fine. It's a city in um, Tunisia. It's the second city. You know, Tunis, probably. That's the capital city. And La Marsa is one of the satellite cities, the second biggest. And their problem was very, very interesting. Um, it's not a poor country or anything. They're at least like, like middle-income countries. So they're not bad. They have roads. They have garbage cans. They have trucks to pick them up. So, but this was a problem. There's a, let's say there's a street, okay? And you know, on that street, let's say there's 100 garbage bins, right? Typically what they do is the garbage man comes at night, right? Goes through every single garbage can. If it's empty, he checks, he drops it. If it's full, he picks it up. But there was a little bit of a corruption issue. What that means is um, the city contracts out the garbage collector, right? But the garbage um, collector, the driver, was kind of on the lazy side. So for example, if there's 100 garbage can, he would check the first 10. And then, you know, in the meantime, just go to a cafe, just chills there, right? And the city officials like, you know what, the rest weren't collected. And he would say, actually, I did collect them, but they got full. I guess the street's really busy, finished. What can you do? Mm -hmm. So they are like, help us in those, for example, those kind of issues. That is an urban issue. So we're like, okay, so what do you think we did? If you were me and you were faced with this problem, what would you do? Because, for example, there's one manual way, just, you know, I, as a city official, kind of wear some camouflage suit, go at night, and Watch. check if he's picking it up or not, take pictures, right? Yeah. That's one manual way, but that's, you know, no offense, that's not so um, impressive. So, what would you do? Okay, perfect, yes. Same Pretty thing again, IoT sensor. There's a company called EQ Labs that we work with. They have something called a clean cap. Basically, what it does is there's a modem in there. It's, there's a black cap. It just looks like a black plastic. In there, we use ultrasound sensor. So that would detect if the garbage is full or not. Yeah. But there's a problem with this, too. Um, since you're some of your tech majors, let's say there's a garbage can, right? And um, you know there's a plastic bag like that. And there's a, a sensor here, and it does that ultrasound. <clears throat> But let's say the garbage, the garbage um, bag, let's say it's kind of crumpled and it's like this and the sensor's here. What's going to happen? Yes, it'll detect that it's full when it's not. So that's a terrible, terrible thing. So I and some of the developers, we kind of have to come up with a solution. What would be a solution? Because you can't get rid of garbage bags. You need garbage bags. Mm. So what would be a good solution to this? Measure the weight. 
Um, that's not bad. But here's the problem: <laughs> it's hard. measuring the weight would incur extra cost. Cost. Yes. You have to like you know put something in there. That's yeah. a really good idea, but we want to minimize the cost. But that's a good one. What's another one? Think about we have to almost minimize or put no extra cost. What's another solution? It's a difficult question. It took yeah. me like like almost a month to come up with a solution. So I'll tell you. Remember I said we use ultrasound, right? But I told them why don't we use photonic based sensors, meaning light or a laser. Why? It's because if we change the garbage bag from black to transparent, which isn't like the price is almost the same, then even if it's crumpled, the laser will penetrate, saying then it's not full. There was one small issue. The photonic um, sensor, the, the, the beam, it, um, it takes up a little bit more energy than ultrasound. So the cat, let's say, would last five years. The laser would last four and a half. I said, that's good enough. And then we resolved it this way. So we went there, we installed these caps on those hundred um, garbage cans. So next time that guy goes, he picks up the first 10. He's like, oh, actually I picked them up, you know, like, I guess it was full. And then the city officials like, oh no, look at this. You, this the first one was picked up at 9.52, 9.54, 9.53, the rest wasn't. You're fired. Just like that. And then they contract with a new, um, new garbage collecting agency and they do a good job. But that's not all. Think about this. In terms of the smart waste management system, it's, I think it's brilliant because traditionally, even without this corruption problem, if there's a hundred garbage can, what would they do? They would, normal person would go to the first one, they would, you know, they would check if it's full, they pick it up. Second one, they check if it's full, they pick it up. Third one's not full, they still check, they have to stop, it's not full, they just keep going, right? But then with this system, you could pre-see, first one 5100 is full, that's it. So what do they do? They go to first one 5100, well, done. You, what do you save? Taxpayer dollar, labor cost, but yes. also you save the environment. Because yes. I'm sure you know through inertia, the car starting is, you know, that's where it costs the most energy. Now we reduce that. Because instead of checking every single one, you check one fifty hundred pounds. So that's, so it saves the city in many, many ways. So in terms of this, even for the actual, um, the cost incurred, what we do is we work with other organizations, we, which I'll talk about, but we kind of didn't need to, because we could invest upfront and then recoup the savings later. So it was a really, really successful project then. The city uh, basically implemented worldwide, and that city became the case study for the entire country. And we, we might actually implement it in the entire country, which is really good. Saves, you know, money, things like that. But one bad thing is that we, we um, get rid of jobs, which is kind of unfortunate, but that's, I don't know what to do about that one, so I'm sure they'll get jobs elsewhere, or maybe they could learn IT and maintain these camps. But one other interesting thing, we did smart waste management systems in other countries too, so basically um, that sensor just looks like a black cap. The reason is because before, the sensor looked like a sensor before, and we installed it in many places, for example, uh, cities in India. Um, no offense to them, but guess what happened? They um, disappeared overnight. Mm. Yes, very, very unfortunate. Therefore, we had to take that into account. We had to make it look like something no one wants, just a piece of plastic. So it just looks like a black cap now. So yes, there were some failure cases, of course. I, I learned on the job, because I didn't think about that. I don't think most people think about that. We just install it there. But then overnight, like 40% were gone. So it was kind of unfortunate. Yeah, so these are the actual implementations that we actually do. That, and it's really rewarding because after a year, you get all the data, all the money saved, all the CO2 saved, you know, all the, the garbage collected, all the you know, things like that. And that is kind of rewarding because to be honest, I'm just a normal person. I'm not a president of anything. I can't like change the world like so much, but I feel like I'm doing a little bit of a difference around the world. That's kind of really rewarding. So, um, yes. So, um, we have another program called Thematic Clusters. I'm not going to go into it too much, but basically it's, uh, we group cities, other cities and companies together to kind of work together to come up with an <coughs> urban solution. That's what basically what we do. Stakeholders like private sector, academia, experts, we put them together and we kind of help them 
do smart city projects. So this is what that is. I won't get into it too much, but basically companies, financial institutions, startups, um, incubators, accelerators, which I actually help startups. They kind of invest in startup academia, international organization. So we work with all these things together to kind of bring about smart cities, smart sustainable cities for all. Because to be honest, even if I sound smart, I don't know everything, obviously. We need the academia, we 